Hello, and welcome back to the World Music Podcast. I'm your host, Will Marsh. Here on episode three, I'm sharing my conversation with the violin master, Kala Ramnath. Kala is known for her singing violin, and she stands among the world's finest, most inspirational instrumentalists. Her playing has been featured on the Grammy-nominated Miles from India project, and compositions of hers have appeared on the Grammy-winning album In 27 Pieces and the Kronos Quartet's 50 for the Future. There's so much we can share about uh, Kala's prodigious musical career. She came from a family of musicians and learned under the legendary vocalist Pandit Jasraj. That is where she became known for her her trademark term, the singing violin. She is an extremely sought-after artist to work with, and she has worked with uh, groups such as the London Symphony Philharmonic. She's worked with music legends such as George Brooks, Kai Eckhart, Bela Fleck, Terry Bozio, Ustad Zakir Hussein, Edgar Meyer, and Ray Manzarek of The Doors, just to name a few. Kala is also keen to enrich the lives of the underprivileged and sick children through music in the form of her foundation, Kala Shri. Well, as uh, much of an incredible virtuosic musician that Kala is, she is just a lovely human being to speak with, and I think you'll uh, enjoy the, the topics we covered about music and life in this interview which was originally recorded on October 19th, 2020. Enjoy. Today I'm, I'm very excited to welcome Kala Ramnath to the show, and um, I've admired her beautiful violin playing for many years, and, and it's great to have you here, Kala. Thank you, Will. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I always like to start off with just kind of wondering how your music training started. And from what I know, your your grandfather kind of started introducing you to music. And I yeah. would just love to hear how that, um, what that experience was like in, in that time, your first uh, exposure to music. Yeah. So I don't know if you know, I come from a family of musicians. Mm-hmm. I'm in the seventh generation in my family. Wow. So my house, everybody plays the violin. Hmm. And uh, I was started on the violin when I was two years old. Wow. And uh, two and a half. I was two and a half years old. And, and they started me on the normal size violin because they didn't have any small violins there in India then. So my grandfather would hold the violin and the bow and I would, with my tiny hands, hold the bow and just bow. I couldn't hold the violin because hands were too small. Right. So he would hold the bow and I'd, I'd join him and act as though I bowed it. <laughs> so it started that way and it was only for... Maybe two, three minutes, I couldn't sit more than that because it was heavy and everything. But slowly, you know, I started building, uh, what do you say, you know, yeah, I just kept playing, uh, increasing my time a little bit more and more and more. And by the age of seven, I was playing full-fledged. Hmm. Yeah, but I st- I have pictures of me when I was four years old the violin bigger than me up right. here. Yeah. That's very yeah. sweet. I think it's in the internet too. If you hmm. see it, you'll find it. Yeah. Wow. So that's how I started. And I guess I had an affinity for the, for music because I did not complain. Hmm. And as I grew up, I started enjoying it more and more. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, another thing I I would love for you to share. I'm I'm curious how the violin became a part of of um I, I'm not sure if it started in Carnatic music before Hindustani or I'm I've never really known how the violin came to India and became a prominent instrument. Now it's it's a big instrument, um but I'm assuming it came from Europe at some time. 
And I would just love to know a little bit about that kind of history of how the violin emerged as, as a voice in Hindustani music. Yeah. So basically, India has had a lot of bowed instruments. You've heard of the sarangi and yes. the ruba, tarshana. All of them are played with the bow, right? Mm-hmm. So, and also, if you go back to Vedic times, there was an instrument called dhanur veena. So veena is like any pro, any instrument, mm-hmm. and then dhanu means bow. The one played with the bow. Mm. So there has been instruments which have been played with the bow from those times, and the, and there is an there is a folk instrument called Ravan Hatta even today in Rajasthan. Mm. If you see that instrument, it has a round, hollow body with a fingerboard which is twenty two inches long, and it's played with. A b- one string only, but and played like this with the bow. Hmm. Now, present day violin has a fingerboard which is five and a half inches, and you play three octaves in four strings. Mm-hmm. That was five and a half into four is twenty two, hmm. and it was played. So, I mean. I I read in Max Mueller's one of his writings that uh, this um, instrument Ravan Hatta was taken in the sixth century from India by the Arabs. They took it to Persia. They made it the rababe, and then when the Moors invasion happened in Spain in the tenth century, they took this rababe there and it became. From there, it went into Europe and became the viol, viola, and then the violin. And then hmm. the Britishers brought it back to India when they colonized India. I in see. the 17th century, it came back to India as a Western instrument, and it came down south. And that's why you find more violinists in Hindustan in Carnatic music than in Hindustani music. Mm-hmm. I'm also a South Indian, but since I play North Indian music. I play the at uh, the violin is here. That's really fascinating. It's kind of like a reverse of what I was thinking. It's the origin of this stringed instrument is very likely from India, and then it traveled, and then became the violin. That is the reason, you know, that we the te- technique is totally different from what it is in the West. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the glides and the slides that I do is. It sounds as though it is made for this instrument, right? Right. Wow. It's not something. It doesn't sound like. Um, I mean, it's crazy. It's weird. No, it sounds like it's just made for this instrument. Hmm. So I guess you know, as time passed from the Ravan Hatta, you know, it was everything was played in one string. All the three octaves were accessed in just one string. Now we are doing it in four strings. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. How that original instrument had, you know, the one string with the same octaves. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and it's there even today. In Rajasthan, people are still playing this. Huh? Yeah, it's a folk folk instrument hmm. called Ravan Hatta. Ravan Hatta. Okay. So. There is a there is a mythological mythological story also. I don't know if you have heard of this story, Ramayan. Yes. Indian mythology. So the demon king there in that Ravan mm. used to play this instrument so well, Dhanur Veena, that this that Dhanur Veena, which was there in Vedic times, the name that changed into Ravan Hatta. Wow, because he was such a master in, on it, and he played it so well. Now that's very interesting because even in the West, we have stories of these great violin players that they were they got people didn't understand how they got to be so good, and there's stories around them with associating with the devil to get their power. 
which is very interesting because we have that in the Ramayana as well. That's yeah, very fascinating. The demon king. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> I, I want to look into that more. That's a very... Some connection. There's not many instruments that have that mythology of, you know, the demon being a part of that. And <laughs> Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and And I guess because this is the most difficult instrument to play because of no frets and right your intonation i guess that's why they said you you know you need the strength of the devil to play this right <laughs> probably well yeah. I, that's great I, I learned something today me too which... <laughs> well i don't i don't think that you had to go to the devil to uh gain your mastery <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the devil inside me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it doesn't sound like the devil. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, your seventh generation, you know, very musical family. I'm sure music was always just a part of your life growing up. Yeah, yeah. And But I'm curious, you know, even though you were holding the violin at such a young age and playing it, was there a point where you really knew like music is what I want to do and what I feel called to do? Was there like a certain time where you remember that? At the age of seven. Hmm. At the age of seven, when I heard, uh, I learned from Pandit Jasraj. Wow. You know that. Hmm. So when I heard his recording on the radio, when I used to return from school, you know, this used to be playing was something. So when I heard him and there was another maestro called Kishori Amankar, Amankar yes. he was a singer. When I heard them sing, I felt if music is this beautiful, this is what I want to do wow. in my life. So it was through uh, Pandit Jasrajji's vocal and... And also I, was, I wanted to... Uh, be a, a play like my aunt because she was my I idolized her hmm. so. wow yes that's amazing five years old you knew that that would be your path hmm. yeah well you know you've you've had a very amazing career as a performer you I mean played all over the world and when you were beginning was it was it stressful? Was it fun? Like, how was it to begin your life as a performing artist? I started when I was 12 years old as a performing artist. Hmm. And uh, I didn't have fear of stage or audiences. Hmm. So I guess uh, I was a natural on stage because I had no fear. Mm, but otherwise... I'm very scared of everything, even a cockroach or in, I mean, I was scared of dogs. Now I'm not scared of dogs. I'm scared of everything I was scared of. Hmm. But on stage, I wasn't scared. Well, well, that works. <laughs> hmm. So I guess uh, I was not stressed when I had to go on stage. Hmm. I guess that's because of the amount of practice one puts in. Then right. you're confident of that. I, I think that must be it. Hmm. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, touring is difficult sometimes. You're traveling and you're busy and you're trying to get the preparation. And then, you know, to play rag music, you really need to be in a calm state and you need to be collected. And let I'm just um, wondering if you were, say, on tour and you only had like 20 minutes to sit with your music before going on stage. What will you do in that time to, if you have only a little time to prepare, what, what best gets you ready for your performance? So uh, I can give an example here. Like once I was in Montreal and I finished my concert the earlier day in Montreal and I took a train to Toronto hmm. and the train got late. So the concert was at... 5 30 or 6 o'clock or something. I don't remember now the time. But I had very little time. I landed at 5. Mm. So when I knew that it was going to get late, I'm not reaching there on time. I kind of told myself there is no 
uh, hope and panicking and nothing is going to happen if i panic right i'm just going to stay calm whatever time it takes it takes to get there but once i'm there i'll i'll be ready to give my best hmm. so what are the things i can do maybe i can dress up in, in the train get ready in the train mm-hmm. and then i can go there and just go straight on stage that's the only thing i can do so there is no point fretting and fuming that oh i'm getting late and you know getting upset about it so so that's how i am hmm. i'm calm if i missed a flight or a train i missed it i can't i did my level best i missed it hmm. it is so it's not that if i have to go to the airport i uh, i i land up at the airport late no i take time to be there at the airport in time but even after doing all that if things like this happen then it's a stroke of fate it's not my mistake right so so that's how i am i'm, I'm kind of calm hmm. and uh, i tell myself let me think about the music i don't need to th- think about these things that are happening hmm. so they do keep coming up but i tell calm myself down saying no no point just take it easy <laughs> hmm it's a very good yeah. attitude did did you yeah. have an example of that or do you just think that's your own nature i don't think it's my nature <laughs> <laughs> because i am a nervous person hmm. i don't like being late i don't like i like to be you know perfect in whatever i do you know hmm. so yes so i've developed it because hmm. i've realized if i do that i'm just spoiling my health and getting you know worked up for nothing because when things are not in your hands you can do nothing it's true wow hmm. uh, so now i wouldn't say i'm in a zen state no yeah <laughs> but yes i'm calm hmm. you know i i know that for many musicians including myself this music is it's like its own form of devotion and prayer and meditation and for me it's even more than i identify more with music than even a f- specific religion and i'm just curious you know if you have some thoughts to share on how you relate to music as as like um a spiritual practice or a form of devotion um yes you know how how is that feel for you and okay so this is what i'd like to say when i play the violin and I- then i do not nothing else bothers me then i can forget this pain you know mm. extreme pain and there could be uh, something really dreadful happening like uh, i don't know something can happen an earthquake or something but it won't affect me and i'm playing and there in that zone i think that's that's what is meditation prayer whatever you want to call it right you know hmm. so that's how i am when i play my music and i also there is also like before i go on stage i always dedicate it to the almighty and say if i play well all the credit is yours hmm. and i also kind of threaten him saying if i don't play well then the credit is all that also the credit goes to you mm-hmm. so you better make me play well mm-hmm. so uh, yeah so whatever i do i feel when when i'm sitting and performing it's i'm not doing it because if it is uh, reaching to that if if i'm able to touch everybody's heart in the audience then that's that cannot be me hmm. it's the music and it's some higher power which is making that that reach the audiences wow yeah i'm finding this to be a beautiful theme in a lot of my interviews that something i'm passionate to share with with our listeners is you know us as artists we are like a vehicle for something 
pop exactly. more great than us to come through and that's what music is it's a channel yeah, yeah. And, and i like to share that with people who maybe aren't you know music students or it's it's a very deep and important uh concept because the minute that i and that ego comes in there you lose it mm -hmm. then if you think you are doing it no you're not doing it yeah hmm. beautiful because there are many times when i've heard my own recordings and i felt was that me yeah right yeah you listen back I, i'm and, surprised you know. was that me like, mm. wow yeah i'm curious you know having studied hindustani music for many years if you can kind of summarize like points say the first 10 years the second 10 years the third 10 years and what kind of things started to be shown to you that you didn't see in the first 10 that you saw in the next 10 and the next 10 because for me as a student i like you know many people we study rag yaman in the beginning and i i am always seeing new things in it it never fails to expand or just inspire me and so i can only imagine that a long life of study there may be so many things that come that that uh steep and yeah. yes yeah so in the first 10 years what i felt i did was get good at technique mm -hmm. so and the next 10 was when i started performing the next 10 years of my life as i had already started performing mm -hmm. so when i used to play initially in those initial 10 uh, 4 5 years 6 years i would always hear my family my aunt my grandfather saying bring in some feel into the music bring in some feel and i would be so irritated at them hmm. thinking what the hell should i do i'm just playing it right hmm. so then then i i had uh, i lost my dad my hmm. father passed away and it was a big setback for the family and i still remember the day I think I started feeling the music was I missed my father and then I was playing and then I so and I had tears in my eyes and mm. and I felt oh this is what they meant when they said bring in feel into your music wow so that was my second 10 year phase mm. and the third 10 year phase was when I was performing the ease of like i would say the second 10 years i would plan my performances you would choose which rag and composition exactly yeah. and what i would play in that you know the beginning it was everything was kind of planned completely from the beginning to the end but slowly in the in the second 10 years towards the end of the 10 years i started loosening up and i could do things like Hmm. I could change rags. I could. You understand? Yeah. And then the third ten years, I think it started even in the second ten years towards the end, like figuring out my own style of playing, what I could do, what I could not do, what I could change, what I could not change, hmm. what I felt had to be changed, and how to change. I think the next 10 years went on that. Hmm. So you'll see me evolving as a musician better and better and better. Yeah. Yeah. That is what I feel I did. Beautiful. And, and when I look back my first 10 years, whatever I played and today, whatever I play, there's a, huge difference the same yaman sounds oh my god was that me hmm. it's so bad yeah yeah it's really one of the beautiful things of this art form and i think all music there's just never an end to it and we're always evolving and this really has no end there's so much to do so much to learn 
I'm still learning. I'm still seeing a lot of stuff, new, new stuff in the same thing and wondering how come I missed this out so many years? Yeah. Um, do you work in styles of uh, outside of Hindustani where maybe you're doing a fusion? Um, yes, I do. Do you, do you enjoy that type of composition and creation? Yes, I do. Mm, beautiful. I do. There's a challenge to it. Mm -hmm. So... What makes a successful combination of, you know, bringing a different, um, different styles together? What, what makes that work and, and be something that is, you know, uh, successful and, and sounds coherent and really something new is created? So for that, I think one needs to uh, first, the personalities between the artists should gel, the mm. first one. Mm. You should have healthy respect, mutual respect mm -hmm. for each other's music. And this, this concept of one-upmanship, you know, putting the artist down, that should not be there, the yeah, other mm. artist. And you should look at music as something which is not competitive. You're going to create something beautiful. Mm. So... If my contribution is less and another person's contribution is more, it should not be looked looked at looked at like, oh, she's doing little, I'm doing more. It's still together. Mm -hmm. Because if that little was not there, still that creation won't be there. Mm -hmm. This is as far as personalities are concerned, as far as music is concerned. I think uh, musically also, you know, you have to start reading each other's mind. And to read each other's mind, if you're going to go and just have, you know, a rehearsal uh, in the green room and then you go play on stage, then that's not a collaboration. Hmm. A collaboration means you work on something for four uh, five, six times, six, like uh, uh, six months or something and then go on stage. Like I played something with the Danish orchestra and the uh, Danish uh, jazz orchestra and the classical orchestra together. Mm. We worked on it for two years. Mm. That's when you, you know, you can exchange ideas and you can understand where they are coming from, where you're coming from and you can find a common space there. To work on yes it's not just a copy paste it's an actual um, yeah. mixture and collaboration yes yeah hmm. so to understand each other it needs time if you really want to create a good collaboration otherwise ja jam session you can do as many as you want yeah mm -hmm. hmm. yeah what, what has been your favorite um collaboration outside of classical I think whichever collaboration I've worked, I've spent a long time creating it. So I like every one of them, hmm. but I definitely do like uh, working with uh, orchestras. Hmm. I also like working with jazz musicians and uh, flamenco players. Hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, coming back to um, raga in Hindustani music, you know, for our listeners, the ragas all have a time of day or a season that they are best played at. And in my study, my teachers didn't really explain the scientific system behind that. But I, I know that there are the prahars, which are like the, the times of day. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, the ragas are all connected with these times of day and the, our moods and the, the changing of the sun. But I feel like there's something kind of more intuitive underneath it all. And I, I believe there is a science, but I, I like to ask musicians how they personally feel like these ragas connect to that time. And what does it feel like to you? And what does this connection mean to you with the, the time of day and seasons in raga? So, I hope you've heard about the 22 microtones in Indian music. Yes. 
And uh, so all the notes, like the 12 notes, the flats and the natural notes, all the 12 notes in the system, they are based on these 22 microtones. So between Sa and Re, I think you have three. Re and Ga, I don't know, three or four, I don't know. So mm -hmm. everywhere you have, you have these microtones which make up to, which make up to 22 from sa to the whole octave so it is these notes these tones that bring this uh, uh, this time cycle into play in hindustani music hmm. so for example if you take bhairav so usually at the time of Bhairav in the morning, uh, you have Shuddha Ma, which is in play, the natural fourth. Mm -hmm. But in the evening, around the same time, you have the raised fourth in play. Tivra Ma, yes. Tivra Ma. And all the notes of the uh, Raga, the ascending and the descending, depend whether it is high or whether it is low, according to the time cycle, timing of the rag. Mm -hmm. Like if you take Bhairav, Bhairav's ray is Komal ray, right? Mm -hmm. If you take Rag Shri, Bhairav, that also has Komal ray. But, the Bhairav, the, the ray of Bhairav in the morning, in case this is the place of Bhairav's ray, Shri's ray is even lower. Hmm. So this has to do with the physiology of the individual. So in the morning, you are well rested. And when you hit the note, you hit it right. But after the whole day, in the evening, when you start Shri, you're tired. Hmm. Then you hit lower. Hmm. So all this time cycle has a connection with the physiology of the individual and nature. Mm -hmm. That's how they have got this time cycle. Hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I, love, I love to hear about that. You know, it's a very unique quality yeah. that this music has that um i don't really see so much in other um music this very yeah. specific um, yeah. time yeah beautiful <laughs> and i'm just wondering you know what um advice you may have to share with with young musicians who are um uh, maybe on a path towards making music a career and um just some, some words of, of advice for a music student. Uh, I would say, say when you learn music, learn music because you love music. Career, everything comes later. Hmm. You know, do it with a passion. And once you're very good at it, then automatically making a career for yourself is not a problem. Because it will definitely happen. Once you're good at it, once people hear you, they're going to want to hear you more. Mm -hmm. But for that, you have to be good in what you do. So at that time, don't focus that, oh, I have to be on stage and therefore I need to do well. No, you do well because you want to do well. And then that happens. Mm. I like that. Thank you. So, you know, we're in some kind of unique time here. Um, I'm assuming that normally you would probably have a busy touring schedule. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> but we are in the midst of this pandemic, which is really yeah. reminding us that, you know, there are things we cannot control in this world. And Exactly. Um, you know, that's kind of what started this podcast for me is I just have more time. I'm not outperforming. And so 
Um, this is just a, an inspiration project because I just love to connect with musicians and, and share the yeah. depth of what we do. And mm -hmm. I'm just curious, how what, what are you enjoying about this time? Are you um, teaching more? Are you having more family time, Riaz time? What is uh what what are you making all of, of those that you said uh. all of those and taking care of my health yes that's the ad i'm I'm thinking you know I should be healthy, so I'm doing all the things that's needed to be healthy that's good, yeah, eat right, exercise hmm. yeah and is there a, a project that you're currently working on, maybe a recording or something that our listeners can look forward to hearing from you that will um, be coming out or anything that you released recently that you would like to share? I released an album with uh, this tabla player called Bikram Ghosh. It's called Rang Colors. Mm -hmm. So I listened to some of that. It's very nice. Yeah, so we did that. And and what else? Yes, I'm just uh, sitting and uh, I mean reading more on music and developing my skills more. Mm. That's the only thing I did. Uh, the album. Mm. Yeah, and of course, there's been so many online stuff happening. Yes. So, yeah, been collaborating with a few of them. Yeah, once in a while. Mm. Do you teach a lot? Do you have many students? Yeah, I have about 10 to 15 students. Yeah, dedicated ones. Good. Yeah. And what do you see as kind of the the future of, of Hindustani music now that it is a global art form? And, you know, what do you see the next kind of evolution of this music looking like, um, kind of from what you've seen in your lifetime? Um, for me, it's it's unique that, you know, I'm from a fully Western background and I know many people like myself that are very serious and immersed in this in this music. And that wasn't happening, you know, in the past, only since maybe the late 60s that started to happen. And I'm just curious what you see um, for this music tradition and what you would like to see as it continues to uh, progress and be passed on. I hope, see, one thing about this music is it's the oldest form of music in the world. And this music hasn't been documented properly. Mm. It's all been passed on from teacher to the student, mm -hmm. you know? Right. So it has never been documented. And with all the upheavals in in the in indian uh, in the indian subcontinent as far as you know people from persia and all those areas attacking india and colonizing india and whatever happened till now the music has kept on evolving mm -hmm. and it is not it's not dead so there is something in this music which keeps it alive mm -hmm. And it's always kept evolving. And uh, like I will say that uh, the masters of yesteryears, the way they sang, music is not being sung now that way. There is a difference in presentation. Mm -hmm. So maybe next generation will take it even further. I do not know how because they're more sa tech savvy and stuff like that. And I'm thinking it will keep on evolving and I don't know which direction it will take, but I hear many people saying this music is going to die and this and that. I don't think it will die. Yeah. Because if it can live for so many years, over 5,000 years, then this has no, this, there is no end to this. Right. It will evolve itself in a better, better fashion. I agree. I think, yeah, it's so unique for a music to become so widely embraced by the world. And it's actually, it's spreading beyond, you know, people all over and the world. it's not documented ever. Yeah. Hmm. So many compositions are lost. 
so many there was there was there was 4840 rags and today i know about 500 of them that's it hmm. nobody knows all the 4840 and even the rags that we know now could have been played slightly different because you can't the notes can't even fully cover you yeah. know some things yeah hmm. wow so yeah so there is so much to dig in yeah yeah, yeah. i i definitely feel that the music will not die in the fact that it's such a long standing tradition it's like has a timeless current moving through it yeah um and to me it, it seems like it kind of reflects the culture of the time you know you got to see probably a lot of the old maestros that you know aren't with us any longer and you got to see that time and from what i know it was more of a slower pace culture people weren't so distracted by you know we're on our screens all the time and now you see we're kind of a more busy fast culture and for example like the role of the tabla has become much more prominent um, exactly which isn't bad it's just different it's it's a change reflecting maybe our, our own culture so um yeah i think we both don't know where it will go but it will keep going <laughs> but it will keep going that's what i'm saying hmm. yeah yes well um kalaji it's just been a real pleasure speaking with you and and i'm so Thank honored you. to have you sharing your thoughts and um to have you on the show so Thank um, you Will. Thank you so much. Much appreciation Thanks. and uh stay well. Thank you. Well, thank you once again for tuning in to another inspiring episode. And I want to take a moment to share with you one of my other offerings that is my instrument shop. And this shop lives on my website, willmarshmusic.com. And something really fun that I've been doing for the past four years is importing really fine instruments uh, made in India. And I import sitars and tanpuras. Many of you know what a sitar is, but the tanpura, if you do not know, is the drone instrument used in Indian music. So in, in any piece of traditional Indian music, you'll hear that tanpura going in the background. Uh, it's a great instrument to sing or chant with, as well as uh, record and, and use in other musical styles. So you can find and see more about all these instruments on my website shop. My favorite instrument is the electric sitar, which I personally designed. And I had a need as a sitar player for an instrument that could plug in directly and play at a, at a louder level and be more diverse for the different types of performance. And over the course of multiple years, I fine-tuned this instrument, partner with an amazing audio engineer, David Enke, of Open to Source Sensors. We finally discovered our, the best place to mount a mic internally on the sitar, and the result is just a fantastic instrument that I think is much needed in, in the world of sitar players. So... If you're curious about any such instruments, again, uh, visit my website, willmarshmusic.com, and you can see demo videos and more information on all of them. Once again, I appreciate your support on another episode. See you on the next one.